Welcome to a continuation of our Orbis CyberSight uh, clinical case series. I'm Dr. Daniel Neely. I am a pediatric ophthalmologist, Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis in the USA. I'm also your chief um, Orbis CyberSight telemedicine consultant and a longtime Orbis volunteer faculty member. Uh, today, uh, what we're going to do is continue discussing some uh, complex strabismus cases. Uh, now, next time I'm with you, we'll move on to some non-strabismus cases. I think I'd like to do some pediatric cataract and possibly um, some glaucoma, plastics, ROP, whatever, um, whatever we would like to do. So if you have any requests, go ahead and send those to us at uh, support at cybersite.org and um, we'll get representative cases on for you. Today, I've chosen four cases. That's not a lot of cases, but I've chosen these four specifically because I have surgical teaching videos to go with them. So um, half our time will be spent on looking at the case, and then a good portion of our time will be spent looking at the surgical technique video. They're usually about five-minute clips. And then, um, and then we'll talk about, I'll take your questions relative to that case. So um, four cases. Um, case presentation, surgical video, and then answering your questions, which you can submit during the uh, presentation. Uh, once we're done with that case and questions relative to it, we'll move on to the next one and we'll cover all four cases. At the end of those four cases, if you have other questions not related to these specific questions, we'll open it up and I'll talk about anything that you want in our remaining time. The uh, Cases today are from the old CyberSight system before the um, uh, upgrades uh, a few years ago. So the format might look a little different. These had to be migrated from the old system. Uh, the format might look different. Um, there might be some data fields missing, but they're great cases. And I've chosen these not just because of the videos, but because they're from um, one of our just absolutely outstanding CyberSight partners, Dr. Do Quang Nok in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, Dr. Nock, I think, holds the record for number of case submissions, um, especially in the early days, and was a great user of uh, CyberSight and now um, is uh, one of the most preeminent um, ophthalmologists in Vietnam. I think he's just done a wonderful job. And you'll see he does a nice job of putting these cases together with the photographs and the medical histories. And uh, so I thank him for allowing me to use these cases. And we're not going to focus so much on our discussion at the end with uh, the treatment plan, um, but mostly the, the technique based on that. So thank you, Dr. Knott. I'll also show you how to search these cases. So um, these are going to have case numbers, uh, but there are other ways that you can search for cases in the cyber site. So if you have a spear oblique palsy and you want to see other cases, you can find that, and I'll show you how to do that. All right, so I'm going to move on to our first case here. So I will go to screen share. You'll see my screen now. And um, those are our questions for later. Let me open up uh, the keynote. All right, so here we go. Our strabismus case series number two. We did four a couple months ago. And our first case is an interesting trauma case. And so we'll sign in here. All right, so this first case, uh, this is from 2003, so this is an older case. Uh, but the first case here, here's the case number, and that's always one way you can search these cases. Uh, but also up here is a search function, and as we get further into things, I'll show you how that works. But um, you can basically enter that data field, type in keywords, and find representative cases. Uh, all right, so this is Dr. Knox's case. This is from a long time ago. Eight-year-old whose vision is 20-30 and both eyes. And this eight-year-old suffered trauma to the right eye two years ago. One year ago, he'd had some surgery at another location in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. At that time, uh, we don't know what his initial findings were, but we know he was thought to have had a lateral rectus recession on the right eye, six millimeters there and he's thought to have had a superior rectus recession on the right eye of five millimeters. So whatever the underlying problem was, he had an XT and a right hyper, all right? But he still has a right hyper and it's about 25 prism diopters and he still has some exotropia 
and he has a chin down head posture, and that's going to be interesting. All right, so scrolling down, refractive air looks normal. All right, so let's get to his photographs here, and let's just start off with his primary position. And here you can see, it doesn't look too bad. You can tell he's got a right hyper. You can see how the sclera is showing a little bit here. But the most notable, noticeable thing is that he's got his chin dipped down. So he's trying to drop that chin down. Uh, so let's look at his, uh, so chin down. So what does that usually mean? Well, let's talk about that for a second. If you have a chin down posture uh, or any kind of restriction, people are typically putting the head where the eyes won't go. So if you have a chin down posture, that means there's a good chance he cannot depress one of his eyes, okay? It also could mean that he has nystagmus with a null point up gaze. So um, two, two diagnostic things you start to think of when you see head postures. So the head goes towards where the eyes won't go. All right, so chin down, we're concerned that maybe he can't depress. So let's look at his uh, up gaze first. And uh, as you can see with the migrated system, these photos are a little bit out of order, but we can see up gaze. Um, here's his up gaze. And it looks like his right eye doesn't go up very well. Uh, let's go gaze up and to the right. Also, not quite going all the way up and to the right there with the right eye. Let's find up and to the left. Looks like it's right here. Does a little better there. So that's an interesting thing. He, up and to the left, he does okay. Up and to the right, he does not. Um, the elevators in right gaze are typically the right superior rectus. So it could be a, a parasis of that, or it could be uh, that it's being restricted by its um, antagonist muscle, the right inferior rectus. So we're kind of already narrowing it down to a couple possibilities here of uh, which muscles could be affected simply because he's got incompetence between right and left gaze. And when we talk about surgery, you're always talking about finding the area where the deviation is greatest, and those are the muscles you work on. All right, but we're concerned about down gaze, so let's look at that. Let's go straight down, and I'm gonna go to large pictures now. Here's straight down. Now you can definitely see that that right eye is not going down, and the left eye is going down normally. Uh, Let's go down and left. Let me find that one. Uh, da -da. Looks like it's probably right here. This is down into his left. Again, not depressing very well at all. And then let's go down and to the right. Last picture we'll look at. Really can barely get past the horizontal meridian there. So, uh, so. He's either not depressing or, uh, so he's either got a problem of this inferior rectus or he could have a problem of the superior rectus. So one way to help sort that out, uh, of course, we don't know what kind of trauma he had. So did he have penetrating sharp trauma where maybe we're worried about this inferior rectus being lacerated? Or does he have blunt trauma where maybe the inferior floor is blown out and the inferior rectus is entrapped or even a roof fracture with entrapment of the superior rectus. Uh, less common, but those two things can definitely happen. So that's something we don't know yet. Um, but I think it comes up down here in some of the follow-up questions. Um, we were talking about laceration there. Uh, and here we have the response from Dr. Nock when we had some questions. He sustained a closed head trauma, fell and was struck in the right forehead uh, by the floor that he hit. So his right eye and forehead were swollen. No, no suturing was needed. So, um, so yeah, so we're talking about blunt trauma. And so that raises the, the uh, possibility of a floor or roof fracture to be higher than the inferior rectus um, problem. So he had some surgery. Um, I will talk a little bit about that because, uh, so he had uh, some imaging and uh, some evidence of a floor injury the uh, the traction test of the superior rectus was free, but his inferior rectus was tight. Okay, so the superior rectus was not trapped, but the inferior rectus was. Uh, it was uh, trapped, maybe had some adhesions, uh, did some exploration of the floor, 
and tried to free up the inferior rectus as much as possible. Um, some additional work was done. He had the superior rectus recessed and the lateral rectus recessed uh, again. And he was pretty good in the primary position, but still having some diplopia on down gaze. So, and that's what I want to talk about here. The, this, he's got diplopia on down gaze. So let's, let's just say he still looks like this. Even though you've gone in and you worked on the floor and freed everything up, he still can't depress this. All right, so once you've made sure that there are no inclusions or restrictions or um, entrapments, once you've done your surgery, if you still have this kind of picture, it's really tough to fix this. Um, so sometimes what we have to do is uh, once we've tried to fix inferior rectus, like, okay, well, we're okay in the primary position, but when he looks down, he's got diplopia. One way to, to address this is to move over to the normal eye, okay? Seems like we're unlikely to make the abnormal eye go down better at this point. So what we do is we come over to the normal eye, and we, you don't want to change the primary position, all right, because you don't want to, he's ortho in primary position, he's just got this hyper in down gaze. So what we want to do is equalize down gaze only, all right. To do that, you can do a Fodden suture or posterior fixation suture on the normal eye, on the inferior rectus. And what that'll do is it won't change that primary position, but it'll keep the left eye from not going down so far so that you can increase their diplopia free field in down gaze only. So the posterior fixation suture or Fodden suture. And that's the video that I wanna show you today because it's a nice technique to have in your armamentarium. People use it for this particular problem. Um, it can be used for side gaze incompetence, um, like a six nerve palsy. I have seen people use it for Duane syndrome, although I don't do that personally. Um, another big use for it is accommodative isotropy with high ACA ratios. You do this on the medial rectus and it, collect, it decreases that high ACA ratio, that overconvergence, if you do this on both medial rectus muscles. So these are people that um, either aren't fixed by a bifocal or um, they're not outgrowing a bifocal as teenagers and you want to get them out of the bifocal. So um, that's, we'll talk about that some other time, but those are the general uses for it. So let's go to the video that I have for this. And that's going to be Fodden. Let's pull that up. All right. And okay. So Fodden, um, you can, this, uh, this is one of my partners. He's using traction sutures for a silk to expose that inferior rectus. I'll just use a couple locking Cassie forceps uh, to pull the eye up, but either way is fine. You like to have good exposure on these, so a lot of times uh, we're usually doing limbal incisions like this rather than a fornix incision because we really want to dissect posteriorly to do this. We want to get back towards the equator of the globe, and we want to be able to put a couple sutures back there. So um, good exposure is important. The Fodden suture or posterior fixation suture, you can combine it with a small recession of the muscle, or you can do it on a muscle that you don't uh, disinsert at all. What you usually don't do is you usually don't do a large recession and combine it with a posterior fixation suture. It just doesn't seem to add a whole lot to that. So if you were gonna recess this muscle six millimeters, you're probably not gonna get much benefit to adding a Fodden. Uh, plus, if they are ortho in the primary position, you don't wanna recess this muscle. So um, you, they can be combined, but in this particular case, the patient's ortho in the primary position, all we want to do is change down gaze. So we need to dissect back carefully. We need to clean this muscle off more than you normally would. You can see we're trying to lice all these uh, attachments to the lower lid retractors. We don't want to, uh, especially if you're doing a recession of this muscle, you don't want to cause uh, retraction of the lower eyelid, particularly common when you do large recessions in young people where those attachments are very firm. This is how I like to do it here is um, a little incision being made right there, but I like to just open those scissors a little bit and just kind of push. So you don't even have to cut. That way if you're just pushing with the scissors open a little bit, you won't cut a vortex vein, you won't cut the vessels on the surface. 
And okay, so this is a 5.0 Mersaline suture. Um, the needle's kind of large. This is probably an S14. Not a, don't love this needle, uh, but it's hard to find 5.0 sutures on smaller needles. I don't love this needle because it's very thick and you have to be careful about not perforating the sclera. This suture is being placed at the equator, so it's about 14 millimeters, uh, hopefully, from the limbus. Uh, 13, 14 millimeters, and once you pass it just to the side to the sclera, now we're going to go through about a third of the muscle width. So you can see we have a good, we're elevating the muscle away from the sclera with the little Stevens hook. You don't want to engage the sclera under the muscle. And you got to be careful to push all that stuff out of the way. So here we are. We've Going to lift the muscle away from the sclera, and now we're going to pass the suture through the other third. So these are two single-armed 5-0 mersaline sutures. All right. Now the key to this, once you've done your scleral pass and then the muscle pass, the key is you need to tie this suture really tight. If it's loose, you're not going to get the posterior fixation suture effect. So you need to have all the garbage out of the way, all that tenons and muscle capsule out of the way. And this is another reason why we use a 5-0 suture, because we can really pull on it and get that knot tight. If you're using a 6-0, a lot of times it'll break when you're horsing it around like that. So nice, big, hefty suture. Um, again, this is Mersaline, but any kind of uh, heavy-duty, braided, non-absorbable non suture will work. So here we can see we have both. Um, I'll freeze this for a second. Oh, let me just back up a touch so we can see our final effect here. Maybe a touch more, oh, not like that far. Okay, a little bit more. All right, there we go, that's perfect. So here you can see what we've done. Uh, the limbus is up here, the limbus is off screen down at the bottom. All right, and then we have our inferior rectus insertion right here, the muscle hook, and then we have our inferior rectus, and here's one 5-0 mersaline, and here's the other 5-0 mersaline. They were passed through the sclera right here, partial thickness scleral bite, very carefully, right next to the muscle. Then we elevated the muscle board, and we came up through it, and we tied it, and we did that twice. So what this does is that when the eye is straight, straight ahead, the insertion right here is the effective insertion. So we're not changing the position in the primary the alignment in the primary position. This is still the insertion. However, when the eye tries to look down, this muscle is contracting, but because this suture is back here, now this is the effective insertion. So it's just like you, in down gaze, it's like you recess the muscle back here. So that's why it only has action in down gaze. And so this is why you can be ortho and primary and you can try and treat 15 or 20 prison diopters of a hypertropian down gaze. So that's the Fodden or posterior fixation suture. Really nice technique. Again, key element, tie that knot really tight. All right. So let me break out of that. And I'm uh, going to check in on our questions now before we move on to our next case. See if we have anything. Uh, and the question is, could be a reverse leash? Jim Polsky, strongly suggesting restriction with or without associated weakness. So, yes, of course, you can have uh, restriction, and which is why uh, the very first thing you want to do on any of these cases, uh, any case that's abnormal, but especially a case where um, you have incompetence or you have um, a history of trauma, you just have to do a, a traction test and you need to know what feels normal and you need to know what's not normal so that, uh, so that um, you uh, uh, can rule out restriction. So, all right. This one did feel uh, restricted. Uh, work was done on inferior rectus to free it up and it wasn't sufficient and now we've moved on to, to that. All right. So let's boogie on to our next case. And I've got one more question. Let me pop back up this. Uh, okay. Will the Fodden in this case take care of the chin depression? 
Uh, the the Fodden may take care of the um, chin depression, but uh, it okay. So it's going to diminish it. You may not eliminate it all the way. If he's doing a head posture in the primary position, it may be because his range of diplopia free vision is limited, in which case the Fodden is probably going to help the chin depression. Um, but the other possibility is that you've got diplopia in the primary position, and if that's it then you're going to need to recess that inferior rectus uh, as well as place a fodden. So uh, that's why you have to look at those um, both. And, um, okay, one more on the fodden technique. For the superior rectus fodden, what is the advice to avoid the oblique? Uh, and that's important because um, it, with the, um, with the, if you measure back, so we're about, uh, so the superior rectus is about seven, seven and a half millimeters back from the limbus. And then we're talking about working back at the equator, which is 14. So you're getting right in the area where the superior oblique is crossing underneath the um, superior rectus. And what I would do is, uh, at least on the temporal border, it's probably going to be close to that. And so just take a Stevens hook, identify the corner, the anterior corner of the superior oblique and just pull it back a little bit. Um, if it's too much in the way, you just got to move in front of it and, but do not get your Fodden suture into the superior rectus fiber, especially there in the temporal corner. Um, either pull it back out of the way or go just in front of it because you'll induce um, some torsional issues or even a, a vertical issue. Uh, along the nasal border of the superior rectus, um, the superior oblique tendon is usually further back, and so it should be out of the way because of that kind of slanting course that it runs. Uh, if not, um, just again, same thing, pull it back out of the way or put your suture just in front of it, okay? Uh, we're gonna move on to the next case so we can cover some more cases, but if there are more questions, I'll come back to those. Uh, go back to our screen share and Exit out of this one. All right. All right. Second case. Moving on. There was our video and our questions. All right. Second case. All right. So our second case. Here we have an 11 year old, uh, vision 20, 40, 20, 25, basically normal 11 year old girl. She's had a history of some right head tilting and a right hyper, or sorry, a small left hyper. Uh, the interesting thing about this case is that she's got significant, she's got some esotropia. Okay, let me just highlight. She's got esotropia of 25 prison diopters and um, She's really got some overaction of both inferior obliques, three plus overaction. So we grade inferior oblique overaction plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. So plus three is a pretty significant amount. All right, and that's what I want to concentrate on with her because um, she also has a little bit of DVD with this. It's not a lot, but it's a little bit. And I want to talk about inferior obliques and DVD surgery. So Oh, let's just look at her in the primary position. There's that little bit of a head posture she has, a little bit of a tilt. But let's look at her inferior oblique over action. Let's go to the large pictures for that. And here you see she's not really quite up and left yet, but this left eye is starting to shoot up. She's got a little bit of an um, upshoot going on there. And then let's look at her up and to the left. Kind of the same deal going on there. All right, so she's really just in left gaze here. She's not even up and left. And here we have right inferior oblique overaction. And then I want to show you a couple more photos relative to her, um, especially this right eye. So her right eye, when you put a translucent occluder in front of her, this is one way that you can photograph or visualize a, uh, a DVD. So it's hazy enough that the dis eye is dissociated and you'll get the upward drifting. And um, 
And you can see that the square is visible underneath uh, that eye right there. So she's got a moderate DVD in this eye. And then not so much on the left eye, at least not that I can see real easy. There's a little bit. She's kind of at the limbus there. And um, so here she's at the limbus, but she's because of her esotropia, she's at the limbus and uh, the eyes in the middle. Um, out here, the eyes in and the eyelid slants up. So the limbus and the lid margin are still touching, but she's actually got DVD here as well. Um, that's just not quite as apparent. So we're talking about esotropia and um, inferoblique overaction and DVD. So that's a pretty common scenario when you have um, when you have uh, congenital esotropia and in, then they get inferoblique overaction later and then they get um, they get um, uh, DVDs. And so what I want to talk about is inferoblique overaction and treating that DVD in those cases. So inferoblique anterior transposition. So let's open that up. And before I start this, we're just going to pause it and talk for a second. Okay. So this person, as we're talking about commonly, you see esotropia with V patterns and inferoblique overaction and DVD. Pretty much a classic uh, set of findings with patients with congenital esotropia. You can see DVD and inferoblique overaction, of course, with exotropia, but this is the classic one that we probably see the most. She's had a needle rectus recession through the fornix already. Now, now the uh, inferior oblique is being addressed. So we're looking down here. This is the infrotemporal quadrant. All right, so the inferior rectus is right here, of course. The inferior oblique is running across here, and it's inserting over here underneath the lateral rectus. Okay, this is where your inferior rectus is, in, or the inferior oblique. Eight millimeters back from the lateral rectus insertion is where your inferior oblique terminates. If you recess the inferior oblique, you're simply moving it from here to back over here, all right? So you're sewing it right along its course uh, along the inferior rectus. If you're going to do a myectomy, you disinsert it here, and then you make another cut across the inferior oblique here, and you remove this whole section of the inferior oblique. But the third option is to disinsert the inferior oblique from here, put a suture in, this end, bring it over here, but instead of putting it in a recessed position, you're gonna pull it forward up by the corner of the inferior rectus. So now that inferior oblique is gonna run across underneath the inferior to the inferior rectus, and then it's gonna curve back up in kind of a J shape and be attached right here. So that's an inferior oblique anterior transposition. What that's doing You've moved the inferior, inferior oblique back, so it's weakened it. So it's like a recession, but you've pulled it forward. So now, because it's forward, perhaps it has a little bit of a depressing effect rather than being elevated, or perhaps it just acts as a passive tether because it's stretched and pulled forward a little bit, that it keeps the eye from not drifting up and giving you that DVD, or it limits that DVD upward motion, okay? So an inferior oblique anterior transposition. Let's let this video run now. Again, um, inferior oblique, I think, is easiest to approach through the fornix incision, even if you don't usually do fornix incisions for your other muscles. Uh, going through tenons now. And um, using the lateral rectus, as a way to isolate the inferior oblique. So it's a 4 silk suture being used for traction under the lateral rectus. Now the eye is going to be drawn into adduction and elevation. You can see that the cornea is above that suture. So that's putting the inferior oblique where you can hook it. And here's a, let's stop right there because that is just a key thing to see. Back up right here and I'll pause it as it gets there. Right there. Okay. So we're using the 4 silk as a traction suture. We've got a hook elevating the inferior oblique away from the 
sclera. This is the triangle you want to see here. So here's the inferior oblique. This hook, this Stevens hook, is just pulling the conjunctiva up out of the way. Lateral rectus is running here. But this right here, you want to see the posterior border of the inferior oblique as it runs up here to insert. All right, so you're going to see a white triangle of uh, posterior tenons and, uh, and uh, orbital fat behind there. Get this out of the way. Go, go, go. And you're going to put your Stevens hook right there past that border, and you're going to hook the inferior oblique out this way towards the orbital rim. Now down here, you're going to see it as the, hook, as the inferior oblique is draped up and over that hook, you're going to see uh, another side of the inferior oblique. Okay, it's make a little triangle. Right down here in this corner, you're going to see a vortex vein. And you want to see that vortex vein because you don't want to accidentally hook it with this Stevens hook. So let's back up a touch. Let it run through this step again, which is so important. And watch that exposure. So there was that blank. There's the triangle hooking. And didn't see the vortex vein there. Okay, but now we're going to buttonhole that on the other side of that infra oblique, clean it off. So we're right up against the muscle. We don't want a bunch of tenons and fat and muscle sheath. We just want, well, we want muscle sheath, but we don't want all the connective tissue going to it. So we're, you've got to unload the orbital fat away from that infra oblique so you don't create adhesions. And there it's uh, being pulled away and cleaning off the insertion. And now we're, we've got a hemis, there's a hemostat being put on. Now we're going to cut underneath the hemostat. So it's right up against the inferior oblique insertion. And so we've disinserted the muscle. Now at the distal end of the inferior oblique, we're putting this, uh, so it's just 6-0 vicral. You don't need anything more than that. It's just one solid pass across it and then a couple locking bites. All right, there's the first locking bite and second one. This muscle's not under a lot of tension, so you, you don't need it like super secure. You just need to have some sutures in it. It's not going anywhere. All right, so now we have it. We have it untwisted. It's ready to go. Now we're going to hook the inferior rectus. Boom. Just Jamison hook under the inferior rectus. And so that's the corner of the inferior rectus right there, right where the muscle's sitting right now. So that that is a zero anterior transposition. We're going to come forward a millimeter or two in front of the corner of the inferior rectus, and we're going to put this suture right there. This one's two millimeters in front of the temporal corner of the inferior rectus. And these two sutures are going to be close to each other. They're only two millimeters apart. And the reason for that is if you spread them out like we normally do with muscle recessions and resections, you can create a restriction, an anti-elevation syndrome. So here, they're being clustered right together, just two or three millimeters apart, and you get that little knot of inferior oblique, and it's right in front of the corner of the inferior rectus, just to its side. And there, there's your anterior transposition. Reposition our conjunctiva. And then, like you can see, a lot of times no suture is needed. All right, so inferior oblique, anterior transposition. Great procedure when you have dissociated vertical deviation in the presence of inferior oblique overaction. Now, if you don't have inferior oblique overaction, you don't, uh, you, you don't want to do an anterior transposition. If, if you have a dissociated vertical deviation and no inferior oblique overaction, I recommend you to do a superior rectus recession. Uh, you can even do an inferior rectus resection if you need to, all right? But usually, uh, uh, eight millimeter recession of both superior rectus muscles or an asymmetric five and eight uh, is the way to go for me when you have DVAD and no, um, no inferior oblique overaction. All right, so let's find our questions here. Get my little captions out of the way. All right, open up our questions. And uh, let's see, here's one has about reoperations. And we'll hold that until the end. Okay, so here's one still about the Fodden. Let's uh, cover that. And the question is, um, what about reversibility of the Fodden if required? Well, to me, that's one of the potential downsides because 
once that's been in there any length of time, it's going to be scar tissue. And you're going to have atrophy of the muscle around that suture as well as some possible restrictions. So they can be kind of tough to reverse. Um, it's not something you're going to go into with the idea that you're going to need to reverse it. Now, on stuff like this inferior rectus that we were looking at, these trauma cases, you're not going to reverse it because you're probably going to be undercorrected anyway. So you're just doing what you can. However, um, the one case where sometimes you might need to reverse it are those uh, accommodative isotropes with high ACA ratios where you're doing it on both medial rectus muscles. Um, and this is why you don't do that procedure in a six-year-old, okay? Uh, those kids, you put them into bifocals and uh, maybe do medial rectus recessions. But I kind of only do the Fodden procedure on teenagers with high ACA ratios once I see if it's going to extinguish itself. Because a lot of times as their hyperopia goes away and um, the accommodative uh, excess starts to burn out, you, you don't need bifocals and you don't need posterior fixation sutures. So the last thing you want to do is be overly aggressive, put one in uh, without seeing what the natural history is going to be, and then, and then get burned and that you're trying to take it down and it's all beat up. So, um, so uh, they are reversible, but uh, you know, it's not something you really want to uh, take a chance on. Um, okay, so this question is about can dissociated vertical deviation come without, without esotropia? Uh, definitely. You can see people who have what looks like congenital esotropia. They've got um, uh, latent nystagmus. They've got infrablique overaction. They've got DVD, but they've got no esotropia or they've got very little. Um, so you can, they, they have congenital ET without the ET. You can also see it definitely with um, exotropia. So you can have exotropia, V pattern exotropia with infrablique overaction and dissociated vertical deviation. So um, that's another relatively common scenario when you can see DVD. Okay. All right. So caught up on our questions. Let's roll on to our third case because it looks like we might not even get to all four as it is. Um, all right, go back to our screen share. <clears throat> and dun, dun, dun. okay, so our next case, um, spear bleak case, spear bleak tenotomy case, which is, you know, look, uh, superior bleak, ah, that's not what I want to do. Superior bleak uh, is challenging for everybody and superior oblique operating is also challenging for everybody. You just don't do superior obliques that often, doesn't come up. So I wanted to put in a superior oblique case and a superior oblique tenotomy. And so let's, where is my pointer? Come on, it's hidden here somewhere. All right, get that out of the way. Uh. All right, got it now. I don't know. For some reason I can't find my arrow on this one, but what we'll do, it's uh, case 15193. Let's just go that route. Uh, maybe struggle bus is here for sure. All right, let me open four, but uh, we'll go, we'll find my case. All right, so search, I want to, uh, all right, so I'm going to 15193, but let me just show you something first. Um, you want to look at superior oblique cases, type in superior oblique. Oh, I see, I got signed out. Sign back in. Uh, right. If I want to look at, if I want to find superior oblique cases, superior oblique, right? And of this will search all the closed cases um, that are public cases. All right. So if someone's made a case private, it won't pop up. But uh, 
if it's a public case and open access to all of us, then you can find it. So, um, Superior Blake, I've got 215 results, and you, you can look at these individually or you can um, filter these, all right? So, there are other ways to filter these. You can see if it's a if you want to look at Orbis program cases, if you want to look by location, okay, I want cases from South Africa, I want cases from Vietnam, uh, you can look by location. Uh, uh, diagnosis, subspecialty, you can, uh, all right, if you want to see user cases, so if you want cases just from Dr. Nock or just cases from, from me as a mentor or dates, all that stuff can be thrown in there and you can, you can use all the filters to sort the stuff out. So, uh, but if you just want to start looking at cases, um, with Superior Bleak involved in them, you got it, just do that. All right, but let's go to the case that I want. And I want 15193. All right, and here it is. Again, this is an old case. This is from 2003, it's a while ago. Let's see. Yep, okay, that's her. Another trauma case. So another 11-year-old girl, seems like they've all been in this range today. Trauma to the right eye seven years ago. She fell, hit the ground, and her right eye and cheekbone were swollen. Um, no sutures were needed. She's got a face turn. Um, exotropia in the primary position. Go away. Exotropy in a primary position, 30 to diopters, larger in up gaze. And down gaze. So she maybe has kind of like an X pattern, perhaps, if it's larger in up gaze and down gaze. Um, let's look at her photographs. So a lot of times when we're doing inferior, uh, superior oblique weakening, we're talking about A patterns. So she may not have a perfect A pattern, but uh, she does have the superior oblique overaction. So let's look at that. Um, let's go primary position first, right? Always look at the primary position first. There she is, a little bit of head posturing going on. Maybe she's got her chin down a little bit, turned to the right. Um, let's look at straight ahead. A little closer up, got her chin down. So chin down, again, pattern strabismus. Sometimes if they're straighter in up gaze, they'll drop their chin. So she could have uh, exotropia with an A pattern and she's straighter in up gaze, or she could have an esotropia with a V pattern and be straighter in up gaze. Uh, we already know she's got exotropia, so she's probably got an A pattern exotropia and that's why she's dropping her chin because her exotropia is less in up gaze. All right. Um, where is the picture I want? Oh, there it is, right there in front of me. Okay, up gaze. Up gaze, got a little bit of exotropia. Yeah, definitely has some there. Um, let's look at her down gaze and see what's going on there. Looks like it could be it right there. Oh, here we are, down gaze. So, wow, look at down gaze huge divergence in down gaze. So let's call this uh, an A pattern exotropy. It's either an A or an X, but she's got big A pattern down gaze. A, a pattern exotropia, A patterns in general, a lot of times indicate superior oblique dysfunction. V patterns frequently indicate inferior oblique dysfunction. So we're like, wow, she's got this really bad uh, A pattern, uh, superior oblique overaction. Head trauma, you start to think about uh, um, uh, let's see where I want. Let's go down. I think this is this one looks like it's down and to the left. And that's probably down and to the right. Again, just confirming this A pattern. Let's get her in straight side gaze and that'll a lot of times show us uh, possibly more of the A pattern. Yeah, I don't see a really good side gaze uh, illustration here, but all right. So A pattern exotropia, um, superior oblique overaction, 
Um, what, what do you do for an A pattern exotropy of superior oblique overaction? Well, um, for that, let's go, I'm uh, sorry, let me come back. I want to go to my whiteboard, so let me break out of the share here. And let's talk about A pattern exotropia with our whiteboard. Okay, and let's go full screen with that. All right, so she's got an A pattern exotropia. So let's say her XT. is she's got some I'm gonna say I'm just gonna get 10 and then she's got XT of 30 in primary and then down gave she's got this huge XT I'm gonna say 90 just for fun all right so a pattern exotropia or exotropia is less in up gaze it's more in down gaze all right and her motility different grid systems here. Remember, we've talked about this before. You can either do an H or you can do an asterisk. I'm going to show you one of each. So this is right and this is left as we're looking at our motility. We know that she's got big time superior oblique overaction. So down arrow, down arrow indicates overaction of the superior oblique. And she's a plus uh, three and a plus three. Amazing artwork, no extra charge. So there you see what that looks like, A pattern exotropia. So, all right, exotropia, A pattern, you could recess her laterals, and if you're going to up or down shift them, um, uh, that mnemonic male, medials go to the apex, laterals go to the empty space. So this is the empty space, open end of the V. So you could do um, lateral rectus recession for 30. So that's a BLR of seven, right? That would get you that. But then you would do a downshift for the uh, A pattern. And so I might downshift uh, laterals for A patterns. Oh, you know, usually it's one half to one, or I'm sorry, to two thirds of a tendon width. Uh, what that's going to do? Well, it's not going to touch this. That's what it's going to do. Um, you might be able to get 30 in primary, and then maybe you can get 40 in down gaze by doing this shift. You're not going to come close to that. And the reason is because you got this. When you got big time oblique dysfunction, you got to operate on the oblique. You have no choice. So downshifting is not going to work. What do we want? We want to do oblique surgery. So let's go find some oblique surgery here. Um, okay, back to my screen share. Let's go to my desktop screen share. And let's roll into some oblique surgery. First, I'm going to, we're going to run out of time, but We'll just do general questions after this one. We won't start a fourth case. So let's look at traction testing. All right. The traction test I'm going to show you is a Brown syndrome. Um, okay? Because that's another time you're doing superior oblique tenotomies. But I want to show you what superior oblique traction testing looks like. Okay? So this is left eye being forced up and in with forceps. Let's watch that again. Come back. No, not this one. Uh, post-op, pre-op, Brown syndrome. Come on. Oh, there it is. Come back. All right, I'm going to restart it before it gets to the end. Okay. Left eye being forced up and in, rotating back and forth. Look how tight that is. It can just get past the scleras. You can tight, tight, tight. All right. So then let's look at what a tenotomy looks like, and then we'll do the post-op test. Uh, all right, so here we have a Brown syndrome traction test, and then it goes into the um, surgery. Tight, tight, tight. 
other one's being done on the other eye, and then we're going to do a superior oblique tenotomy. And I'll pause it so I can make a comment here. Approach, it's a little bit edited so it goes kind of fast. Approach to the superior oblique is the same whether you're doing a tenotomy or a spacer um, or a transposition of the superior oblique for a third nerve palsy. So um, all of these have the same general approach. Um, I like to approach them from the I like to approach them from the um, temporal side. Just not it's going on to the other movie. All right. I'll get this yet, I promise. So all right. Restart playback. All right, I'll try not to stop this time because it doesn't like that. All right, same thing, traction test. So you do these from the temporal side, you can um, stay out of the, uh, you make the incision on the temporal side, but then you're locating the superior oblique on the nasal side of the superior rectus where it becomes condensed. All right, this is switched eye. So we're actually on the, the this is the right eye right now. And this was going from the temporal. All we've done is hook the superior rectus. All right, now we're reflecting the conjunctiva and tenons back over to expose the superior rectus, okay? We didn't buttonhole here nasally. Uh, we made our incision out here. We hooked the superior rectus, and then we simply stretched that incision up over and tucked it under the knob of the hook. Now we've put in a Damar retractor, and we're looking at the filmy cover of the muscle capsule of the superior rectus. You like to um, not cause a lot of dissection up in here, especially if you're doing um, superior oblique spacers. Because if you're doing a spacer, uh, you don't want adhesions or scar tissue. So we've made a temporal incision, but we're gonna be looking for the superior oblique over here. And because that's where the tendon condenses down and is discrete. If you're looking for the temporal corner, it's really posterior, and it's, the insertion's all fanned out. It's kind of hard to find out there. Here, it's like a little rope, and it's easier to hook. So we're going to open up this muscle capsule, and then we're going to identify the superior oblique along the nasal border of the superior rectus, and that's going to be about eight millimeters back. This could be about eight millimeters behind the insertion. All right, so let's start it up and do that. And just replacing the hook, uh, you want to be sure you don't have that superior oblique tendon incorporated into the hook. All right, so what did they just do? They just measured back eight millimeters to get a ballpark idea right there. See, calipers are up there. Getting a ballpark idea of where is that tendon going to be. Good little pearl there. Now, picking up with two forceps, two thorp, picking up the the cover of the superior rectus, and we're dissecting down to the surface. Down to the surface. You don't want to cut in the muscle, but we want to see the superior rectus border. And surface. There's the surface of the superior rectus muscle. And then we're going to stretch that hole open. Now the DeMar retractor is going to go into that hole and kind of hold it open. So now We've got some tissue out of the way. We should be able to find that discrete border of the superior oblique right where that cotton tip is. We're going to find it right there. And it, there is that pearly, so get that pearly strand right there. Once you see that pearly strand, then you're going to put a Stevens hook from the back side and hook forward. Now we've got it plus uh, the tendon sheath and but you can stretch it out and you can put a cotton tip on there and dry it. And you can see that pearly band right there. That's our superior oblique tendon right there. And now we're just going to, in front of it, we're just going to open this stuff up. So if you're going to put a spacer in, you put in some sutures after you open it up. Then we're going to open it up. We want to see the tendon. We don't want to just cut through all this stuff indiscriminately. All right, getting close to the tendon. All right, now there's the tendon. Now we're cutting through the tendon, and it's going to snap. Boom, there it goes. Cut the superior oblique tendon. And this tenotomy is right along the nasal border. That's where you generally want to do it. If you get close to the trochlea, you can get overcorrections. You can get too much effect. So 
Uh, we've tucked it all back in place. Now we're going to repeat that traction test. And again, this is the right eye, so we're going to push it up this way. And look how the, it almost can bury the cornea. So that's what it looks like after a traction test. If, you, if it doesn't look like that, you may not have done a complete tenotomy. All right, that is a great little demonstration of a superior oblique tenotomy. All right, um, okay, we are down to just a five minutes. So let's break out of here and let's do, um, let's do some questions and uh, cover all this. Uh, let's close that. Stop my screen share and here we are, boom, back, gotcha. All right, opening up questions. And uh, let's see, okay. Is it common to develop superior oblique palsy with weakening surgery? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, you can cause a superior oblique palsy when you weaken it, so you have to be careful. Um, you don't wanna do it unless you need it. Because if you, if you cause a superior oblique palsy, it's hard to fix. Um, so that's where the decision to perform the surgeries um, um, more important uh, the, almost than the technique perhaps. Um, but that's why some people do spacers or chicken sutures. They, they control the lengthening of that superior oblique tenotomy. If you sew in a 240 retinal band and you're gonna put in seven millimeter retinal band, the superior oblique can only go out that far. Or if you put in a chicken suture 50 mersaline and you measure that, that those two ends of the tendon are now only um, five to seven millimeters apart, yeah, you've controlled that, all right? But if you really need to weaken a superior oblique uh, tenotomy, then you do a tenotomy. Now, when you cut those ends, it doesn't just go like this and, and to go anywhere. There are so many attachments between that tendon and um, the periocular tissues and the trochlea, like the tendon doesn't slide through the trochlea. It's still in the trochlea. So you're just getting some lengthening. Uh, but yeah, that's why some people will try spacers first and then only do a tenotomy if, um, if the spacer doesn't work. Uh, another way to do this, you can do the tenotomy, uh, or not a tenotomy, and just do a disinsertion. So you go out, um, you can isolate the tendon nasally or isolate it temporally. And then once you hook that superior oblique insertion, you just cut it loose there. And that's a mild way of weakening the superior oblique um, tendon. Uh, or you just do the posterior fibers and leave the torsional fibers intact. So different ways to do it. Um, so uh, I only do superior oblique tenotomies if you ha have three plus superior oblique overaction. I think if it's just one plus, I, I usually try to stay out of there and maybe just do up shifts, down shifts. And, um, and someone is asking um, an appropriate question about torsion. Uh, will a complete tenotomy induce torsion? It can. Yeah, so um, people who have fusion, you have to be careful about doing bilateral complete tenotomies because if, if they have normal stereopsis and normal fusion and you do a tenotomy, then they'll have some torsional diplopia. You just gave them a bilateral spirit palsy. Uh, in my experience though, usually when you're doing this, uh, these people have great big strabismus angles and, and no fusion. And so you can usually, uh, they're not bothered by the torsion, okay? So be careful if you have a fusing patient with an A pattern. Um, you may wanna just play it safe and do upshifts of the, of the rectus muscles or downshifts, whatever you need. All right, so yeah, torsional diplopia is good, good question. Um, and there was another question about torsion, but there's good questions. Uh, but again, patient selection, you don't do it on people who are going to, um, to get that or who are at risk for it. All right. Uh, and this is a good one too. I hinted at this during the discussion. Uh, the question is what to do if there's a recurrence, uh, or residual Brown's effect, uh, when you do a SO spherically spacer for Brown syndrome, um, uh, and so this happens to me not too infrequently. Um, I like the spacers, but I frequently find that people are undercorrected. And 
So maximum size for a spacer, well, they can be whatever size you want. I suppose maybe in the ballpark of 10 millimeters uh, is going to be maximum because, look, you, whatever distance you have between the nasal border of the sphere rectus and the trochlea, that's the maximum spacer length that you can do. Uh, most typically when I do a spacer, it's, it's uh, six or seven millimeters, five millimeters. Uh, so I think kind of seven is more maximum from a practical standpoint. Um, if you do a spacer and two months later they still have a big restriction, big head posture, what I do is I go after two months, two months after any strabismus surgery, uh, because there was a question about timing of repeat surgeries. Uh, two months after any strabismus surgery, if, if I don't have the effect that I need or if I had an effect that I didn't want, uh, then I go back and I do a second surgery. All right, so um, uh, that's timing. All right. Um, go back and I just do a tenotomy. Uh, I may take the spacer out or I may just cut it. All right, uh, and this is a good question. We'll cut, this will be our last question. And this is, please explain the, the M-A-L-E, the male uh, mnemonic, all right? So let me go back to my uh, uh, whiteboard for this. Mnemonic is male. M-A-L-E. And it's a simple way to remember which way to shift the muscles. So 20 ET, you're shifting the, you're, you're operating on the medial rectus, right? That's a BMR for 20. But I wanna help compensate for the 30 and down gaze. So um, I want to shift the medials while I recess them to help get this 30 down here. And so the first part of the mnemonic is MA. And that stands for medials so your medial rectus shifted to the apex. All right, shift. And then the A is apex. A-P-E-X. Apex, apex is the point of a triangle. All right, so shift and it, so it doesn't matter if you're doing recessions or resections of the medials. If you are um, treating any, any pattern strabismus and you're working on the medials, wherever the point of the triangle in the pattern is, medials to the apex. So if I was working on an A pattern, esotropia, the medials would be upshifted, medials to the apex. If I'm working on a V pattern, esotropia, medials go to um, down. Male, the second part of male, M A L E. Laterals to the empty space. Replace her L. What's the empty space? Okay, so if this is the apex of the pattern, the empty space is the area between the legs. So this is the empty space. So if I'm operating on the, the laterals for a V pattern, they get shifted up to the empty space. If we have an A pattern, that's the apex, right, A. If I'm, shift, if I'm working on the laterals for an A pattern, they go to the empty space, so they get downshifted. So you don't, have, you don't really have to understand the mechanics, you just have to understand that um, uh, what, which, the, the male, medials to the apex, laterals to empty space, boom, you got it. Uh, advanced placement is understanding the, um, the mechanics of that, okay. Uh, we are over time limit. I, I know there are more questions, so I will um, answer these by, um, uh, by text or email, and we'll include those with uh, the case discussion here. So thank you for your time today. Um, keep in mind, our next case series will move on to some non strabismus uh, I'll cover some pediatric cataracts and pediatric glaucoma, um, maybe show you some vitrector technique for infant cataract surgery, uh, maybe we'll talk about goniotomy and trabeculotomy, some very practical information, I think. Uh, so thank you for your time today. This will be available uh, with transcription uh, on CyberSite in the uh, webinar library. Uh, take a look at this and all the other uh, material that we have for you there. 
um, please send us your consults, free consults, not today only. Um, so send us your consults. We'll get them to a subspecialist. We'll get you some uh, an opinion on what you should do, and then you can uh, do what you want to do based on that advice. All right. Thank you for your time today. Good day.